prioritize in the Savane. I request uh, members to go through leisurely. Reward Swamiji, Nirbhayananda Swamiji, Saraswati. He is the president of Ramakrishna Vivekananda Ashram, Gadag and Bijapur. He is a graduate and was a bank employee in his pre-monastic days. Very early in his life, he came under the influence of the inspiring life, work and philosophy of uh, Swami Vivekananda. In the year 1984, Swamiji founded Vivekananda Seva Kendra in Mongolia of Bijapur district, which has now become a free residential school for orphans and underprivileged children. He has adopted children of Kargil, Martres, and he has given them free education till the 10th standard in his residential school. Later in his life, Swamiji came under the influence of Swami Purushottamanandaji Maharaj, a senior monk of Ramakrishna order, and under his influence, Swamiji took sannyasa in 1993. I personally know Swamiji for last 18-19 uh, years. In, word, in one word, my experience with him, I can tell you that is like a reincarnation of Swami Vivekananda. After your address, you will feel that Swami Vivekananda himself has come and addressed all of us. That is the nature of personality, such a simple person, humble person, and he is not a person with super, uh, some superstitions or anything, very scientific personality, and his address will speak high about him. With these few introduction remarks, I welcome once again Swamiji and over to him for his address. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Madhav Murthy. The world is changing so rapidly, and many people are paralyzed with the fear of anxiety what our future will be. The angels, just like Swamiji, can guide us through these changes and give us a solid foundation how to have values, the core values and the ethics. Okay, may I request Pujya Swamiji to kindly address the gathering. Sthapakayacha dharmasya Sarva dharmasvarupine Avatara varishthaya Ramakrishna yate namaha Pavitram charitam yasyaha Pavitram jivanam tatha Pavitrata svarupine Tasyai kurmo namo namaha Namashri yatirajaya Vivekananda Suraye, Satchit Sukhaswarupaya, Swamine Tapaharine, Mukam Karoti Vachalam, Pangum Langhayate Girim, Yetkrupa Tamaham Vande, Paramananda Madhavam. My dear Shri Vishwanath, the Chairman of South India Regional Conference Arrangements, my dear Suresh Vostwal, a dignitary on the dais, and a man of tremendous dynamicity, competence, 
and reliability. Shri Madhu Murthy, a long-standing acquaintance of mine, the former chairman of Karnataka chapter of chartered accountants and South India chapter of chartered accountants and probably the vice chairman All India Chartered Accountants Association. All the dignitaries seated off the dais, my dear friends. I deem it really a privilege that today I am a participant in this beautiful mega program. It is an opportunity, I should think, that I have with me some people with whom I can discuss some issues of present national relevance in particular and issues of international relevance in general. We all have assembled here to orient our attention, to orient our zeals to certain very subtle issues that go a long way in shaping the minds of people in the country. The first and the foremost task of any meaningful education system is to shape the minds of the people that come under the influence of it. Minds must be properly shaped, minds must be properly structured, minds must be properly trained. The unfortunate, whether it is central government or state government, not much of attention or not much of emphasis is being laid on the training aspect of the mind. They are all more particularly about filling the brain with information, filling the brain of a student with information rather than training the mind. Information is necessary, but it has got its own limitations. At any point of time, whether it is in the student stage or when you are a chartered accountant or when you are a prime minister, it is the mind that matters and not the amount of information the mind has been able to carry. Indian culture has been looking at all these things in a very serious way for the past several hundreds and thousands of years. Lot of fermentation has taken place in the borders of India on issues of this kind. Lord Curzon himself says, empires existed in India when the British people were still in the oblivion. They had painted themselves blue. British colonies were simply jungles. This is the observation made by none other than Lord Curzon himself, who was Viceroy of India for some time, later became the Vice Chancellor of Oxford University. Lots of experiments have taken place in this land. Every experience of the man has been studied thoroughly, dispassionately. Whether it is a bitter experience or a pleasant experience, every experience has been thoroughly studied. What causes brought this experience? Why this experience of mine has been bitter? Why this experience of mine has been pleasant? The causes that brought about this experience could bring about the same experience in case of others also or it was only confined only to my setup. These causes could bring about this sort of a development only in my case or it is, it is something of a universal consequence. In a very scientific way, observing taking into consideration all aspects of a particular phenomenon, a thorough study has been made in India, remember. That is what Curzon meant. Empires existed, not empires in the political sense, empires of the thought world. Empires of the thought world also existed here when perhaps the Westerners were not able to keep their eyes wide open. 
when they could not know how to keep themselves awake, widely awake, to take into account everything, every present cons of every phenomenon. Here we were in such a way whereby we could have a scientific and thorough study of the human situations based on which we came to certain conclusions which later constituted what is known as the wonderful Indian wisdom which is in very much demand everywhere in the world even today, even today, Indian wisdom, Indian wisdom, Indian wisdom. I think it is in this background today we have to assess the importance of values, vishwas, values. Where do values stand? Are they something of bygone days? I am not an archaic personality, or for that matter, nobody is an archaic personality. If you pay some attention to values, they sustain the world. Values sustain the world because they impart an order for the human tendency. They condition human desires. They restructure the human instincts. Man cannot afford to become impulsive. History is full of accounts where impulsive people ultimately have landed themselves in a disaster. History has lessons in that. History is not a story. History is a place where so many warnings can emanate. If a sensitive mind can look at history, it can see so many warnings, so many directions, so many instructions. History is a great center, great origin of education. An impulsive civilization has been drowned at the collective level. An impulsive man has been drowned at the individual level. You can't be impulsive. You need to condition your mind instinct, which is the parameter, which is the framework, the mold in which your mind is to be conditioned, that is value. Value is a mold. By casting into where your mind gets the shape that it needs. Why at all we must have any shape for the mind? Otherwise, it becomes a destructive mind. Destructive mind, my dear man. Mind can elevate a man. Mind can spoil a man. This is another beautiful piece of Indian wisdom which we were able to derive as a result of our scientific observation of every human experience. Amrita Bindu Upanishad beautifully puts it. Mana eva manushyanam karanam bandha mochayoho. The mind, the mind that is responsible for your bandhana, for your mocha. If you want to become a man of infinitude, a man of infinite dimensions like a Buddha, a Jesus Christ, a Vivekananda, a Ramakrishna, Every man is capable of imparting to himself that infinite dimension. We are no tiny human entities crawling on earth. We, we, we need not crawl on earth like a creature. We can't be creatures. Rather, we should be, we can be the creators of our own history. We can create glorious chapters for the accumulated history mankind has already preserved or man, mankind has already constructed. You can add your own glorious chapter. Every man is capable of that. Bruhadaranika Upanishad says, Tattva Masi, Tattva Shveta Ketu, Tattva Masi, you are that infinite dimension. Infinite dimension encapsulated into human psychophysical system. But capable of bringing out that infinite dimension, Provided you conditioned yourself into some conducive atmosphere. Probably the present atmosphere is detrimental for that evolution to come out. Why? Why do you want to suffer in this detrimental conditioning environment? Can't you tear it and throw it away? Free yourself from the shackles of your own conditions and limitations. Why can't you do it? Oh man, presently probably you can't do it. So many people cannot remove these conditions and put themselves in that perfect royal road that can carry them, that can lead them to that wonderful destination. 
how a Kalidasa, an unlettered fellow, could become a Kalidasa of wonderful standing? How an Einstein, a dull-headed fellow, during his high school days, could become the recipient of two Nobel Prizes? How one Thomas Alva Edison, who had schooling just for three months, could become a man who could claim 2,000 important inventions in science? Michael Faraday, that went to school only for six months, could become a scientist par excellence. A Ramakrishna, who could not write his name, could become a guru of such a great man, Swami Vivekananda, who was described by Americans as a man more learned than all American learned professors put together. Is this possibility confined only to some particular individuals? particular nationalities, particular religions, or is it something universal? Indian experimentation, Indian culture, Indian past studies, Indian typical methodology of observing every phenomenon and every experience of man in a dispassionate way has come out with that wonderful teaching that this is universal. Every man is capable of putting himself in an infinite attitude, in an infinite dimension. He need not suffer through any limitations at all, whatever may be his present condition, then how to unfold that infinite dimension? There is a science, there is a training for that. The training and the science we call as a value system, dharma, dharma. That is dharma. Value system, dharma means value system. Dharanat, dharma ityahu. The one that upholds you, the one that lifts you up, upholds you, that is dharma. The whole of Mahabharata is a beautiful textbook that deals with what is dharma. How everyone should stick to the injunction of dharma through thick and thin, come what may, you have to abide by, you must adherence to the injunctions of dharma. You, you must adhere to the implications, the meanings, the commands that dharma is giving. Otherwise, what will happen? You will become a Duryodhana. A man with a tragic end. A man with a tragic end. Here, on the other part of the world, we have another example. The example of a Napoleon. Of course, I am not weighing him on par with a Duryodhana, but as an independent study, I am taking Napoleon also to illustrate my point. Napoleon did not pay so much attention to values. Even today, most of us, we don't feel prompted to pay, value, to pay attention to values. Most of the times, we dismiss the relevance of values in our life. Why? Why value? What value? Do you think values are universal? Probably some time ago, they were relevant. They are not relevant today. Probably we may even go to the extent of saying, some vested interests devised all these values because they wanted to exploit us through all these instruments. Every instinct will come, every interpretation will come, good or bad. Impulsively, man goes on giving his own interpretation. Let us go for an experimentation, a verification through the pages of the history. Napoleon was not a man who paid so much of attention for the higher values. Lower values are there. Higher values are there. Lower values, we call them lower values for the only reason they must be in agreement with the implications of the higher values. They cannot violate, they cannot violate the expectations of the higher values. They cannot become independent. Lower value cannot become independent. All their pursuits, all their methodologies must be promotive of the meaning and implication of the higher value. Lower value must be in subordination to higher value. Lower value must promote the meaning and the objective of the higher value. That is how values are graded. There is no other parameter for that. Napoleon, undoubtedly a man that took tremendous benefit by following the lower values. What was the lower value? Swelling the ego, I must reign supreme. My country must reign supreme, even to the exclusion of the welfare of other countries. Howsoever wonderful it is, howsoever fascinating it may appear for a man of ambition, a Caesar culture, an Alexander culture, a Caesar culture, 
imperialism must be there for the rulers of the world that imperialistic attitude must be there but remember the word the word imperialism is impregnated with a tremendous meaning several dimensions are there india also was imperial not that we were not imperial not that we were confined only to our boundaries but the imperial attitude of india the definition that india derived for the word imperial was in total contrast with the meaning that the word imperial carried in the western sense in the western context ashoka is a typical example of indian imperialism ashoka sent his armies to egypt he sent his army to burma probably to ceylon but what sort of army was that the army consisted of the peace ambassadors the ambassadors that promoted universal welfare the ambassadors that promoted international amity international peace geographical boundaries were obliterated they were removed they were eliminated all were embraced all were embraced together in the spirit of love i and you are no different rather you are more important than me i should strive for your welfare first then my welfare will come my welfare need not be taken into consideration at all because as long as i am conscious of your welfare my welfare is being automatically taken care of whether i want it or not unknowingly it is served more than what the situation used to be if i were to pay all my attention to my own welfare this is the foreign policy that indian imperialism as illustrated by ashoka and others really had its message for the whole world this is the type of the foreign policy that we adopted not a single country in the history of the world not a single country in the world today among 200 countries presently we have has undergone 1% of the vicissitudes that india had to undergo but india still remains india still remains greece did not adopt that sort of an imperialism because they said values are irrelevant as long as our aggrandizement is unaffected as long as our sword has no enemy that can properly check our movement what sort of a value conquest of countries is the only value we want to conquer i came i saw i conquered well what value is there beyond that if caesar might have thought on those plans on those lines today we do not lack caesars who definitely at the individual level may think what value is there by following this particular methodology my self interest is being served that is all the value why should i stick to any other norm not only in the world of chartered accountants in the world of politicians in the world of official circles almost everywhere and almost every every bit of you know the working class today we are surrounded by somewhere some sort of a callousness an indifference towards value is creeping and it is assuming more and more of a dimension it is assuming more and more of a momentum which is definitely not good for the universal welfare for the sustained fruits for the sustained fruits this is not the methodology that we need to adopt okay coming back to the case of napoleon napoleon was a man that paid scarce regards for the adherence of the values what was the effect what was the consequence at the collective level at the collective level like a duryodhana who happened to say janami dharmam nachame pravruti janami adharmam nachame nivrutti krishna you may give me any amount of teaching about dharma and all that probably you are under the impression that i don't know dharma and all that remember i know dharma i know the value system that i need to abide by dronacharya during his during my education has taught me enough of all those things i know dharma not that i am ignorant of it but the problem with me is that i can't adhere to it i can't follow it janami dharmam nachame pravruti i don't feel i don't have an impulse i don't feel like following it at all janami adharmam i know adharma also the opposite of dharma 
but I can't refrain. I can't refrain from involving myself. I can't refrain from participating the precepts of adharma. Knowing dharma, I can't practice. Knowing adharma, I can't keep it aside. It's a dilemma in which I am steeped. I am plunged. Value system was not completely taught to Duryodhana. Because any teaching involves three stages. Effective teaching involves three stages. Shravanam, Mananam, Nididhyasanam. First you hear, you lend your attention to a teaching. Shravanam, Mananam, go on reflecting upon the pros and cons of it. Pros and cons of it. Why should I follow this? Reflection, deep reflection, discussion with friends, trying to examine this particular teaching from all angles. Indian academic culture expects a student to each and to examine a particular teaching from all angles. Please question your teacher, question your teacher, question your teacher is a constant refrain we come across in the Indian academic culture. Uparishad says, Pariksha Lokan, Karma Chatan Brahmano, Nirveda Mayan Nasti Kurta Kurtena, oh, the seeker of Brahmagnana. Brahmana means the seeker of Brahmagnana. Anyone who seeks Brahmagnana is a Brahmana. Oh, seeker of Brahmagnana, Pariksha Lokan, Karma Chatan Brahmano, Nirveda Mayan Nasti Kurta Kurtena, test, test everything, verify everything, test, subjected to ruthless verification. Investigate, test, question it, analyze it, tear it apart, question your teacher, make him miserable in the classroom. This is an essential feature of Indian academic culture. Krishna also exhorts, he upholds the same principle. He says, Tadvidhi pranipatena pari prashnena sevaya. Why I am telling this? When I say you have to follow value system, you need not accept it in toto or you need not accept it just like that on its face value because some Swamiji is saying I have to accept. No, I never expect it. Please verify. All Indian values have been any number of times verified. They are all verified values, time-tested values, eternal values. No one is an injunction. We do not believe in faith. No faith. Faith is not needed. Have faith after the verification. Don't believe. Never believe. Neither Upanishads, nor Bhagavad Gita, nor Brahma Sutras, nor Vedas expects a man to believe anything. Test it. Verify it. Experiment it. If what we say is true, then only you follow. Otherwise, please don't follow. Don't misguide yourself. See the scientificity. See the science there. It is through that science India has derived all these value systems. Ahimsa, Satya, Asteya, Brahmacharya, Aparigraha, Shaucha, Santosha, Swadhyaya, Ishwara, Pranidhana, Tapasu. Our dharma has got ten components. What is dharma? Dharma has got ten components. Dhruti, Chama, Dama, Asteyam, Shaucham, Indriya, Nigraha, Dhihi, Vidya, Satyam, Akrodham, Dashakam, Dharma, Lakshanam. This is Dharma. All are values. Not going to temple or smearing with a forehead, with a vibhuti or doing anything. They are all religious practices, but they are not religion in themselves. Religious practices that promote that religious spirit in you, that inclination, more and more of inclination to take Dharma very seriously. Those practices will promote your inclination towards religion. But they themselves are not religion. This is how value system has been derived. Duryodhana got it, but did not reflect upon that, did not experiment. He did not experiment with values. Therefore, could not have faith in that, could not have confidence in that. So was the case with Napoleon. Okay. Here Duryodhana became an emperor. There Napoleon also became an emperor. But what was there at the end? how their life ended. Can you consider them as success in human history or do you consider them as failures? You need not consider. How do they consider themselves? What is Napoleon 
in the assessment of Napoleon himself, in the assessment of Napoleon himself, because of his transgression of values, because of his violation of values, he was a failure. In his own assessment, he was a failure. You know why? I would like to reproduce before you the soliloquy of Napoleon in his last days, when he was thrown, when he was put in imprisonment in the island of St. Helena near Africa by the British. He wrote an autobiography. At least he tried. Probably it was halfway through. He could not live to continue. In that soliloquy, in that little bit of autobiography that he has written, a beautiful passage is there which catches our attention. Napoleon's all observation of the life process through which he was, through which he passed, is contained in that passage. His whole life has been summed up in that little passage. He says, there are two types of powers in this world. There are two types of powers in this world. The power of the spirit, power of the spirit, atma, the spirituality, the power of the spirit and the power of this world. The power of the spirit has always vanquished the power of this world. This is Napoleon's observation, not my observation. Julius Caesar, Alexander, Charlemagne, and I, we all founded empires. We built up empires. We were no ordinary lot. But upon what the power of our empires did exist? The power of this world. Jesus Christ alone built up his empire on the power of the spirit. Napoleon knew only Jesus Christ and therefore he made a reference to him. Even Buddha built up his power of his power on the power of his empire on the power of the spirit. A Rama built it up, a Krishna, a Ramakrishna, a Gandhi, a Vivekananda. They all have built up their empires on the power of the spirit only. Napoleon did not know all these people and therefore did not make a reference. Not, does, not that Christ alone built up his empire on the power of the spirit. Men of similar tribe, men of the tribe of Christ, they all have built up their empires on the power of the spirit. And Napoleon continues, even to this long day, millions would die for that Christ. While there is nobody who can die for my sake now. I am powerless now. I was an emperor, but now I am powerless. There is not a single person who can care for my welfare. A one time, an emperor of the whole Europe, now I am left with no one. I am lonely. I have no one. Christ is no more. He is dead. But every day, millions of soldiers are joining his army, and his empire is gone extending. It is going on extending. Without the help of a sword, without the help of one rifle, his empire is ex expanding. This is the foreign policy, the imperial policy India believed in. This is the imperial policy India believed in. This is the imperial policy Ashoka highlighted. It culminated in the emergence of Ashoka, even though a very scrupulous adherence to this imperial policy was there almost by all Indian kings earlier to Ashoka's emergence. It got highlighted up in the case of Ashoka. He stands as the living representation of Indian imperial policy, political or otherwise. What made the difference between a Napoleon and a Buddha, Napoleon and an Ashoka? Here, certain values were emphasized. Victory, conquest, the superiority, all these terminologies, they were defined in a different way. Their supremacy, superiority, conquest, victory, they were defined in some other way. What was the difference? Here, values became the weapons. Values became the weapons. Their arms, arms became weapons. Political power. Material affluence, political power, money power, me, me first, I first, you are all there to serve me. 
ego the world the world there is presided over by the ego the world here is presided over by the egolessness by the true self the atman self food is there with the atman here the pronoun i is more associated with the self here the pronoun i is more associated with the, with the word ego there mine mine what i have man is there man is judged by what he has here man is judged by what he is man is judged by what he is a christ was never judged by what he was today christendom is the strongest kingdom the mankind has seen but christ did not have any army christ was not judged by what he had what he had but what he was what he is what he would be forever which is more powerful till now for the past half an hour or 40 minutes we have been dispassionately assessing two value systems two power systems the power of the west power of the east power of europe power of asia even christ is an asian he is not a european power of europe power of asia power of asia has got its supremacy over the power of europe india survives greek did not survive romans did not survive they did not survive india survives the empire whose message was peace love i and you are one rather you are preferable to mine your interest is more important than my interest this is the essence of all values when a client approaches a chartered accountant when a devotee approaches a sanyasi a sanyasi should rather pay more attention to the needs of a devotee than pursuing his own personal liberation vivekananda says if a person pursues his own liberation mukti i call him a selfish man your mukti should not be aimed at your mukti should come to you as a by product of your efforts to promote the welfare of others who are in no way related to you you must be an ahuti an ablution for this cosmic yajna that is going on krishna says in bhagavad gita make your life an ablution for the cosmic yajna that is going on what is that cosmic yajna tremendous spirit of interdependence tremendous spirit of my entering into your mind your mind entering into my mind we two forging ahead we two forging together into one whole humanity instead of keeping ourselves as individual separated heterogeneous components of a mass this is yajna as defined by krishna india upholds the spirit or the culture of interdependence not independence remember the world is going on because of the principle of interdependence i says where to move where not to move the leg leg will take its own course if i were not to say where to move where not to move the leg would not have remained what it is today it would have broken itself i every moment is helping the leg leg is helping the i in turn spirit of interdependence a inter spirit of interdependence between a client and a chartered accountant between a sanyasi and a devotee between a teacher and a student between the electorate and the ruling class we are all one the spirit which is upheld for which even united nations organizations also stands uno perhaps is the strongest agency to promote the spirit of interdependence no nation should live as an excluded entity all nations must enter into meaningful participation with each other there should not be a single sob anywhere in any corner of the world which should not produce an echo in your own mind when you sob it must produce an echo in me when i laugh you should participate in my laughter when you cry i should shed, shed some tears 
otherwise am i a man are we in human society this is indian culture the importance of values is upheld like this therefore dharanat dharma ityahu this is a beautiful order it is this order that has sustained this world till now anyone at any time who acts as a threat to this order i will incarnate and i will remove him from the system krishna says because this order must remain everyone should go for the personal sacrifice you first then me kausalya approaches rama just before he leaves for the forest tears are shedding down throat is choked eyes are trembling lips are wavering comes and embraces rama she has become crestfallen her whole being is burning at the information that rama is leaving ayodhya and going to forest she could not bear it she could not bear it even for a while comes with a plan to withhold rama from going to forest comes and says rama you say dharma 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 to preserve the honor of your father you are going to forest you are saying to keep up the words of your father you are going to forest you are saying but stand i am here to tell you not to go keep up the injunction of your mother fulfill my desire a mother is more preferable to father under any circumstances on any issue that is what the dharma says if your pita your father is very much important for you how much more important your mother is according to your own shastra rama comes out with a beautiful beautiful refinement for the sentiments of kausalya he says amma there are two types of dharma samanya dharma and vishishta dharma ordinary dharma and special dharma a special dharma always says if you are in a dilemma about which course to follow not knowing which is right and which is wrong then you follow that course where more of self sacrifice is involved where more of self sacrifice where more of the sacrifice of self interest is involved now if i follow your injunction i should remain in ayodhya if i want to follow my father's injunction i should banish myself to the forest i am in a dilemma to be or not to be a shakespearean statement like that to do or what to do, to do this or that what to do rama is in a similar dilemma now as a man of wisdom as a man of little judgment i should follow that course where more of my personal sacrifice where more of the sacrifice of personal interest is involved by going to forest more of the sacrifice of personal interest is there therefore i have to take recourse to that ramayana is not a story it is not something to pass away your time it is not a means for a past time it is not to kill your journey time that you have to hold the book of ramayana in your hand it is a science of human values a science of social order a science of healthy social order a science of philosophy of life a science of human growth human growth here the kingdom of ego is bidden goodbye and the kingdom of self is entered into the kingdom of self the kingdom of ego are at lager heads always inside kathopanishad says kashchid dhiraha pratyagatmana maitshat ye dhira will always go by the message of the self world and not the ego world this is indian culture 
therefore if at all we should build confidence about our our own selves in the eyes of others we must become men of values the men of values are values will not desert you they will not desert you america is there as a powerful country because of values remember not because of natural resources they don't have 10% of natural resources we have but they have perfect value system which they are following consciously deliberately willingly not being forced by a police system abraham lincoln when he was the president of america wrote a letter to the headmaster of the high school where his son was studying only an american president can write such letters what did lincoln write two sentences are very apt for this occasion lincoln writes addressed to the headmaster the letter was addressed dear sir my son lost his mother very early in his life i have been a widower i only have been nurturing my children in a way that was possible to me but i am conscious my taking care of them has been inadequate because no one can fill the gap of a mother they have been motherless to the extent possible i have been taking care of them now you are joining to shape their minds as a teacher as the headmaster of the high school as a father i would like to bring your attention to a piece of requirement of my son what does he require or what i want you in what way i want you to fulfill his requirement i want you to train him mainly train him what sort of training i just sum up in two sentences he says please make my son a successful man in life make him successful that's all but along with that also teach him that to fail you is more honorable than success through uneven means failure is more honorable than success through uneven means through defective means this must constitute the essence of any value based education system any meaningful education system in support of this teaching there took place an incident in the life of c v raman a great indian scientist who lived very much nearby here only in malleshwaram you have raman research institute you have indian institute of science and all that a beautiful incident took place yeah in the life of c v raman raman had called for the interview of junior scientists probably to help him in his research work several junior scientists had appeared they were all post graduates in physics probably one fellow one seeker of the job entered into the room room and offered an interview he was not well read he was not well equipped in the knowledge of physics therefore raman said i am sorry sir i can't take you as my junior your appeal your application is kept aside okay let us see what will happen to it later the fellow went out but he did not leave the campus and go away he was still loitering in the corridor outside and that was the corridor was just adjacent to the room in which interview was going on raman could see this man loitering moving pacing up and down outside the corridor trying to draw the attention of cv raman towards him raman got a little annoyed basically he was a short tempered fellow by nature also raman immediately summed up the junior scientist inside and annoyingly told him have i not told you that you are not selected why are you sticking around please go away you are causing disturbance to me the junior scientist or this fellow said sir i know i am not selected and i don't regret that also either but the problem with me is that you have given 100 rupees 
towards my traveling allowance. I need only 40 rupees to come from my place and go back again. The remaining 60 rupees that is with me, I am not supposed to carry back to my home because traveling allowance involves only 40 rupees, 60 rupees, excessive 60 rupees does not belong to me. I should not carry it back to my home. I am looking around. I am not finding any man whom I can remit this 60 rupees and go away. I am trying to request you whether you may please accept the 60 rupees which I want to give you and go away. Can I give it to you only? Raman was very much moved at the honesty of this man and he immediately said, report for duty from tomorrow. I have selected you. Report for duty from tomorrow, I have selected you. What did Lincoln write to the headmaster of the school? What methodology, what preference, what priority Raman is following here in framing his judgment? Values are outmoded. Values are useless. They are not beneficial. They will desert you. They will land you nowhere. No, they will sustain you. They will enliven you. They will lift you up. Ye Oberoi, the owner of Oberoi Hotels, he became the great Oberoi because of his value system, not because of his hotel management technique. Because of his value system, he became Oberoi. Ye Gandhi was not a gold medalist. Because of the value system, he became a great force who has been inspiring series of people, Nelson Mandela, Wash, George Washington, King Washington, Barack Obama, series of people who have been shaping the destinies of their countries are being inspired by this half-naked fakir who was no gold medalist but a man of value system. Value systems are not useless. Dharana, they hold you up. This is Indian culture in which we are all bred. We should not neglect them. We must not neglect them. It is scientific too. I shall just read before you a passage by a Nobel laureate and conclude my speech. <clears throat> this man is Charles Stones, a great American Nobel Prize winner a scientist worked extensively during World War II in designing radar bombing systems, invented the maser and laser, and his other contributions are microwave spectroscopy, quantum electronics, radio, and inframed astronomy. This is the biodata of the man, the background of the man, whom I am quoting now as a conclusion of my speech. What does he say? Indian students should value their religious culture. And of course, the classical Indian culture bears importantly on the meaning of life and values. I would not separate the two. To separate science and Indian culture would be harmful. I don't think it is practical to keep scientific and spiritual culture separate. This Indian culture attracted Naipal, the father of modern English prose, V.S. Naipal. You know what does he say? I am just quoting verbatim what he has said. The older I am growing, the more Hindu I am becoming. The older I am Hindu here, I am not meaning in a chauvinistic sense, in a fanatical sense, in a confined sense, as a system that has upheld and patronized the culture which Mr. Toes, a Nobel laureate, has made a reference to. That is all. Neither it has got any geographical, nor a regional, nor a creedal, nor a sectarian connotation rather as a repository of the value system that has attracted the appreciation of this great Nobel laureate. Therefore, my dear friends, science can denature plutonium, 
but it cannot denature the wickedness in a human heart is the observation of Einstein, Albert Einstein. All these things corroborate to the point that values are not to be neglected. If you neglect values, temporarily it may appear it is beneficial. But remember, in the long run, that is going to ruin you so much so that it may not be possible for you to lift yourself up again. Like what took place in the life of a Napoleon, in the life of a Duryodhana, and so many other people who are unheard and unknown. Again, my association with the community of chartered accountants has been a long-standing one. I had addressed chartered accountants in Sophia High School in Bangalore some three years ago. I had addressed them in Hubli, in Dharwar, when there was a regional conference with which our Anand Portnis, etc., were associated some four or five years ago. I also addressed chartered accountants in Haspet. To crown them all, today I am addressing you all. What a wonderful gathering, what a beautiful arrangement. In 2008, I had an occasion to address Indians in America. The Akka Sammelan that took place in Chicago, Association of Kannad Kutas of America, Akka. The auditorium there was so vast that it could contain 25,000 people. Huge auditorium in Chicago. But the gathering that I had, whom I addressed, was not so much encouraging and inspiring as you are today. Therefore, I can, without even the least hesitation, claim that this is perhaps the greatest and the most eventful occasion that I happened to address. The opportunity was given by the organizers who have been my friends for the past several years, my well-wishers, my close acquaintances, people whom I value very much. They gave me this opportunity. The other day, when Mr. Vishwanath and Madhav Murthy approached me in Bangalore, to take my consent to be the speaker for this program, which has become a reality now, I never knew that the program was of this dimension, both qualitatively and quantitatively. My joy knows no bounds. I feel exhilarated. I feel exhilarated. I only pray God that I will have more and more occasions like this to address people so that the great Indian values can disseminate it in the way they deserve. Thank you so much. Thank you all.